Good evening and welcome to this meeting of the Planning Committee. My name is Councillor Bill Fleming and I'm the chairman for this meeting. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. Committee members when invited to address. Ah, there you Sorry. Go. OK, we've got a live microphone somewhere that should be switched off. All uh, right. Is it yours, Carol? OK, sorry, committee members, when invited to address the meeting, please ensure your microphone is switched on so that it picked up via the live audio feed. When you finish addressing the, the meeting, please turn off your microphone immediately. Please ensure that you have switched off or to silent any other devices that you may have that may interrupt the meeting. Live broadcast, we, please note that this meeting is also being broadcast live and members of the public not in attendance today are able to view the proceedings. Officers present today. Um, we'll start with Caroline Nash, committee administrator. Dale Barker, planning manager. My uh, role is to advise members. Ross Chambers, legal services. Um, Amy Fleet, Planning Officer. Sarah McPherson, Planning Officer. Louise Coleman, Planning Officer. OK, we're done. Note for public speakers. Public speakers will be given a 30 second warning during their speaking time. Once you've finished speaking, the committee may wish to ask you some questions, so please remain seated. If there are no more questions, you can leave the table, ensuring your, ma your mask is left on and you have wiped the table with the wipes provided. Have we got wipes on the table? Yeah, we have. OK, right, we'll now move on to the agenda. Agenda item one, apologies. Have we received any apologies? Chairman, apologies from Councillor Richards, Councillor Kendall, Councillor Adam and Councillor Eden. Thank you. Thank you very much. Agenda item two, disclosures of interest. Do any committee members have any interest they would like to declare in relation to items on the agenda? Councillor Crump. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm Ward Member for Upper Council 2101274, FUR, Welfare Centre, Craven Lane, Southam. And I've registered to speak, so I won't be taking any part in that debate and, until it's my time to speak. Thank you. Uh, declaration from myself. Um, on the item for 87 High Street, Bidford on Avon. Um, I'm not the ward member for it, but uh, I'll be speaking on behalf of the objectors, so I'll exclude myself from the, the debate and the vote on that one. Minutes. Do I have a proposer and a seconder for minutes held on the 7th of July? Yeah, proposed by Councillor Mills, seconded by Councillor Jennings. That was it. <laughs> Thank you for that. OK, move on to the planning applications. Agenda item four. Application number 20, oblique stroke 02839, oblique stroke FUL, land near to Bishop Sitchington, Stratford on Avon. I invite the planning officer, Louise Coleman, to present the application, please. Thank you, Louise. Right. Uh, the site is located approximately uh, 490 uh, metres south of Bishop Sitchington and 480 metres north of uh, Nightcote Village and identified by the black dots on the map. The site, which is marked with a red line, is approximately 82.5 hectares of agricultural land made up of nine fields. Two public rights of way abut, abut the south, the site's southeastern corner, and further public footpaths are located in the vicinity, identified by the green hatch lines. Most notable are those within Christmas Hill and Piper's Hill, which are situated approximately 1.9 kilometres to the west those within the Burton Dasset Hills to the south, together with a centenary way identified by the pink dotted line. Old Town Farmhouse, which is a grade two listed building, is located where my arrow is, approximately 260 metres to the east, 
and also the grade two listed and scheduled ancient monument beacon tower identified by the star here um, and also the Grenington Hill camp which is just off here uh, are located within the Burton Dasset Hills approximately 2.9 kilometers to three kilometers to the south. Within the site itself it's mainly located within flood zone one however there is an area within flood zones two and three this is primarily outside the site edge in red, but there is some extending within this zone. This is the layout plan showing the landscaping. Uh, the proposal seeks to construct a solar farm with supporting equipment within 56.8 hectares of the site for a temporary 40 year period. The anticipated capacity of the solar farm is 49.9 megawatts in connection to the grid is proposed via underground cabling along Nightcap Road and the B4551 over a distance of approximately 2.5 kilometres. The panels themselves have a maximum height of 2.7 metres and 0.9 at their lowest point. Perimeter fencing around the site is 2, uh, sorry, 2 metres in height. Uh, CCTV cameras mounted on 2.5 uh, metre high poles and there's also associated building structures and plants, but a maximum height of uh, 4.1 metres. The arrangements of the panels are shown in the layout plan and existing hedgerow and tree planting around the boundaries of the fields and the perimeters of the site are largely being retained and supplemented in areas, especially along the southeastern corner of the area of the site here. This is a zoomed in um, um, plan of the uh, proposals. Uh, an access point is proposed in the northern section of the site adjacent to the boundary with Blue Barn Stables with a new internal access road and a DNO, DNO substation located about 11 metres behind the proposed hedge line. Uh, an access is also proposed utilising the existing um, um, entrance um, in the southern part of the site and a temporary construction compound is proposed within the hatched yellow area here. This would be in position for a temporary period of around about three months. Turning now to the visibility splays, in order to achieve the necessary splays, um, a section of hedgerow identified in pink here would need to be removed, but you'll see that the area in green is proposed new hedge planting, which would be behind it. And this is further identified within this plan here. Um, this is photograph, so um, self-explanatory. That's the visibility to the south and the visibility splay to the north. Looking now to the southern splay, again, there would be a requirement, so this is the uh, access point here, there would be a requirement for an area of a hedgerow to be removed, however, again, being replanted along here. Um, just to note here, the gap here, th there is an existing footpath that runs alongside this area here. Uh, this is a photograph, as you can see, the existing access and visibility splay to the north, that would be unaffected, but the south, it's around this section of here, which would need to be removed and, but however, replanted. Turning now to some photographs of the site, um, you'll be able to orientate yourselves by the map at the, the, the base here. So this is me looking towards, um, from Nightcap Bottoms, so the uh, start of the solar farm is behind this hedgerow here. And then this is the view from the public footpath SMA, so SM85A along from Nightcut's bottom. And then this is a view along Nightcut bottoms. So this is behind this hedgerow here. It was the start of zone, uh, what they defined as zone five of the solar farm. Uh, this is a view, if you're looking here, looking directly towards zone five here. So as you can see, it's quite exposed at the moment. And so new hedgerow planting, which is gonna be allowed to grow to up to three meters in height is proposed. Um, you'll see this 
further on from the photograph that I've just shown you, new hedgerow planting is also proposed along this area here where the footpath um, currently runs. Now this is taken, so I'm from the footpath looking back um, in a suddenly direction towards um, Nightcap Bottoms and Nightcap Road. So this is the area where the solar panels will be going. This is the new hedgerow that will be installed. This is a view looking towards the west. So the, pan, uh, the zone identified as zone three would be behind here. This would still have panels in here. Um, now I've gone to, um, sorry, I've got the screen. It's covering it. Oh, you can't see. It doesn't matter. Um, around here, if I can show you, this this is uh, Christmas Hill and Piper's Hill, and um, these are views uh, from years one and five, um, showing the solar panels, um, well, the solar farm, and um, from that vista. Don't mean to do that. Uh, this is a view from Beacon Tower looking towards the site. And so this is in a northerly direction. And this is a view from Burton Dasset Hills, uh, so away from the tower, but this is for a year one and a year five. So this is the area where we're looking at here. Uh, and that's the end of the presentation. Uh, Chairman, there are a number of um, updates to report. Um, historic England have confirmed um, no objections to the development on the historic asset grounds. And then the LLFA have also removed their objections. And the recommendation is to grant subject to the conditions and notes as detailed in the report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Louise. Thank you for that. We've got uh, quite a few speakers on this one. Um, and uh, first one we go to is uh, Councillor Steve Tressier, Tressler, sorry, uh, Bishop Tichington Parish Council objecting. Uh, Councillor Tressler, you've got three minutes. We'll, uh, we'll give you a 30 second warning. Okay, start when you're ready. Parish Council objects to the size of negotiation and the style of the vote. Can you turn on your microphone, please? Okay, can you hear me now? Okay. The Parish Council objects to the size and location of proposed development which contradicts several policies in the core strategy. The committee reports concurs the Parish Council's view that the application contradicts policies in the core strategy in terms of scale, visual impact and sustainability. Most significantly, the proposal contradicts policy CS3 on sustainable energy. We would like the following to be considered. Impact on agricultural activities and disturbances to agricultural land. The land in question has been product has been productively for decades, in fact centuries, for growing crops. Impact on the openness and character of the landscape on a visual amenity. The impact is enormous. Topography of the site, the impact is greater than of the proposed Deppers Bridge solar farm, also in the field and fire bale, which was refused and subsequently dismissed at appeal in 2015. Grounds for refusal and dismissal in this case were unacceptable harm to the landscape, character and visual appearance of the area, based mainly on NPPF policies on which the SDC's planning policies now stand. 
those same grounds exist for this site. Impact on the character of the historic landscape. Archaeological, archaeological surveys conducted for this application have shown that the site is an extremely rich historic landscape dating back to Roman and Saxon times. Policy CS3 states that proposals will be determined with regard to the Council's renewable energy landscape sensitivity assessment to assess the capacity and sensitivity of the landscape to accommodate the scheme. This ass assessment states that the proposals proposed on site being over 25 hectares and in the field and vale farmlands has a me medium to high sensitivity to solar energy developments. It specifically highlights the sensitivity of the area visible from Burton Dasset Country Park, which this is. It is for the committee to decide in which to uphold core strategy planning policies or risk setting a precedent which could lead to inappropriately large solar farms occupying vast areas of agricultural land in the district. This development is too large in this location Sorry, to be I'm sustainable. Stopped. Sorry, you've had your time now, Councillor. So uh, we, we really need to sort of wrap it up at this point. Okay, as it contradicts many core strategy policies, especially CS3 renewable energy. Thank you for your time this evening. Thank you. Sit, 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 uh, hang on a minute. <laughs> uh, does anybody have any questions for the councillor? Councillor Crump. Oh, yeah. I've been as a county councillor for a while, so I've got to give you something while you here. Um, I noticed a joint consultation response from yourselves and Burton Dusset. Um, it said that some residents of Burton Dusset had, had missed out some of the, as part of the consultation. Was that the same for Bishop Sitchington as well, or did you, or was that okay? Did you, the, the consultation response, ex, um, the applicants' agents have carried out a number of consultation events. However, the failure to deliver invitations to the correct addresses and missing out residents of Burton Dusset Parish um, meant that some of them missed out the opportunity to respond. Was it the same for Bishop Sitchington as well, or was the consultation okay? Consultation was taken. Um, I think there probably is improvement in in the in in uh, the detail that we need to review. I don't. I wouldn't say everyone has been um, consulted as they should have been. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions for the councillor? No. Nope. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thank you. No. I say now we have uh, uh, Mrs. Lynn Pearson, a resident, and Cynthia Bettany, a resident. Um, you've got three minutes between you. You can do half each or however you want to do this. That'll. Uh... Do you want us to give the one and a half minutes and then the 30 seconds to the end? Who's going to start? We've both cut ours down. Yes. The fact that I was told I could have three minutes to myself a few days ago has actually set this alarm bells ringing this evening because I've just found out I haven't got three minutes, I've got one and a half. But if Mrs. Bettany would like to start off, I will try and leave out a lot of my points and uh, concentrate on the main. Oh yeah. So uh, whoever wants to start, start now, please. Okay. Um, this is Cynthia Bettany. I'm Vice Chair of Burton Dasset Parish Council. Burton Dasset Parish Council continues to object to the proposal. The Burton Dasset Country Park is designated as an SLA. The Broadview Wind Farm proposed on the same land was rejected because of visual impact. The proposal fails a site size sensitivity test. A 15 to 25 hectare site is considered to be medium to high. How does an application for H2.5 hectares fit in with this framework? It exceeds the framework by over 250 percent. 
quoting from the White study, which is referred to in your CS3 as part of the Council's Renewable Energy Landscape Sensitivity Study, Felden Bale Farmlands, it states, and I quote, the scale of a development is recommended generally to small to medium to avoid adverse effects on the topography, landscape pattern and settlements. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nay. For you to carry on, that please. Thank you. The development would be a large industrial site in the centre of a rural tourist area, the construction of which would go against the strategic aims of the Council's own core strategy. I quote, the rural character of the district will have been maintained and enhanced. The green belt and the countryside will have been protected from inappropriate development. A new development will take into account the intrinsic and special values of the landscape. This development of over 80 hectares will totally alter the ethos of the area. It generates four point mile loop of a 2.4 metre high solid metal fencing, bearing more than 150 CCD cameras placed at 50 metre intervals, more inner city than rural. The area is clay based land and site floods regularly during periods of wet weather. A substantial part of the report submitted by the applicants themselves could not be completed during, due to flooding. Last week, the government announced developers are to be barred from building on land at risk of flooding. Therefore, the application should not even be under consideration. The Felden, Felden Vale is an established migratory route for overwintering birds, which fly at night during migration periods. Reflection from panels during a full or partial moon would make the entire site resemble a lake or small group of ponds. Birds attempting to land, to rest or refuel would be injured or killed and could damage panels. The applicant's proposal states that once the site has been cleared from prime agricultural land and the panels installed, a glyphosate based herbicide already banned in the EU will be used on areas to be seeded with grass to restrict weed growth. This weed killer is deadly to bees and flying insect life. And in a recent study in Taiwan, 2019, it has shown that this is a high cancer risk once in the water system. The application goes against the SDD's own core strategy and government policy. It would harm the local area immensely and be an eyesore. It should not go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you. Does any of the members have any questions for either of the speakers? Councillor Curtis. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm sorry, obviously you were speaking very quickly to get, to get in. No, no, that, that, that's most helpful. I wouldn't mind, I find it helpful if you could just um, say something again about the herbicide. That, yes. yes, please. Yes. Um, I'm a vegan and recently I have had a second. Right, I'm a beekeeper. Recently, this um, particular glyphosate based herbicide was tried to uh, be used in East Anglia to um, cut, kill uh, the areas around the sugar beet crop because of infestation. The government um, looked at it and banned it because of the report saying that it did have um, a high run cancer risk once in the water system. And if you have a look at the uh, Taiwan University study of 2019 on the Internet, it will show you that there is a high cancer risk once this gets into groundwater. Sorry, Jim, um, just for clarification, it's, pro it's proposed that this, this um, herbicide would be used would on be this used site. To spray to clear the land, and then once a year it would be used to keep the weeds down. Okay, so Dixon, yeah. Thank you. Um, you mentioned there the uh, glyphosate and the area of sugar beet production. Yeah. Did anything in that report basically say it was banned or not not required because it was a food production area? No, it's deadly Sorry. to insect life, flying insect life. So it wasn't the fact that yeah. it was sugar beet? No, it's it not because it was sugar beet, but keeping the area and margins of the sugar beet fields yeah. down using this. But yeah, I think you were referring perhaps to leaching as well. That's yes, a, leaching. Yeah. I mean, it's a flood area and the, yeah. it goes straight into the river Thank you. Can I just ask a, a question myself? Um, this this herbicide, if it's banned in East Anglia, was it not a nationwide ban or is it's it just... It's banned in Europe. It's not banned in this country now that we're out of the EU. So um, the government had a look at it again after yep. um, the British Beekeeping Association actually contacted them about it. And they looked again at the proposal and said, no, you can't use it. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. 
Right, and our next speakers are uh, for the applicants and our supporters. We've got Mr. James Hartley, Bond, the agent, and Mrs. Pat Hudson, resident. Chair, if I may, um, Mrs. Pat Hudson isn't here tonight, um, but if members refer to their update sheet on page two, they'll see her, her written comments are there, and they just go over onto page three, and her reason for not being present is also quite clearly there. Uh, on the update sheet. Thank you, Chair. So James Hartley, Bond, the agent, um, you actually have six minutes if you should need them. Thank you, Chair. Councillors, ladies and gentlemen, my name is James Hartley Bond. I'm the Head of Project Development at Low Carbon. I'm not going to try and convince you this evening that there's no impact from the proposal before you. We, like your officer, recognise there are both impacts and significant benefits from the proposal, and your officer has carefully considered and weighed these in her report. We commend the detail and comprehensiveness of the report, and it's noted that this is a balanced judgment in favour of the proposal with the benefits outweighing the impacts. These are the reasons why that we consider this the right recommendation. Firstly, it's important to note that the proposal has evolved as a consequence of technical studies, community engagement and discussions with your officers and statutory consultees. As such, there are no unresolved technical concerns from statutory consultees. The process of evolution has also meant that we have been able to pull the development back from sensitive areas around neighbouring properties, plus through careful siting and landscaping, mitigate views from local and distant vantage points, including uh, Burton Bassett Country Park, as you have heard, which is approaching three kilometres from the site. Whilst the development cannot be made invisible, we agree with your landscape officer that the proposal would result in few significant harmful visual effects for such a sizable site. So to our mind, it boils down to the more subjective matters of landscape and visual impact weighed against the significant benefits of the proposal. As noted by your landscape officer, the Vale farmlands in which the proposal is situated is identified in the council's renewable landscape sensitivity study as the main landscape out of 20 others in the district most able to accommodate solar development without extensive landscape character harm. So in other words, all other 19 landscape types in the district were assessed as being of greater sensitivity and thereby less suitable than this area. Whilst we understand the concerns over scale, officers consider that the proposal can be assimilated successfully here. As members will know, the council has declared a climate emergency and events of the last few weeks and months are showing us the frequency and severity of such events are increasing both at home and abroad, meaning that collective action must be taken. This proposal represents a significant opportunity to help with this emergency and in providing enough clean energy for over 25% of the district's homes, it will help with the Council's ambitions on its journey to, uh, journey to net zero. To this end, I respectfully ask that you approve the application. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, does anyone have any questions for Mr Hartley Bond? OK, I'll go first. Um, good evening. Um, was there consultation with the parish councils or, or residents? There were. 
Uh, yes. So, so um, on, on to that point exactly. Just to provide a bit of clarity, um, we the first the consultation that we undertook, there was there was an error in that process, and there was uh, there were a couple of things. There was an error in the um, uh, an admin error internally, but also an error with the distribution. So we used a, a bespoke distribution company to um, to basically they do uh, hand dropped mail drops. And it turns out that certain properties were missed. There is a new development on the edge of um, Bishop's Etchington that, that wasn't in the in the area originally because it's a new development. Um, we then held our hands up. Um, and so one of the consequences of that is that we actually ran a second consultation, used different means of, of, uh, of distributing the mail, so Royal Mail. Um, and essentially the consultation was then run over about two months. So so we, we fully held our hands up about the first error, but we hope that uh, during the course of the two months that the consultation was undertaken, that that provided sufficient opportunity. Can I go? Sure. <clears throat> and, and the response on that, on your consultation? Um, so broadly, um, so probably slightly more uh, against um, a, a chunk in the middle that we, we sort of measure neutral responses and then uh, probably a third or so or just over a third that were that were for the proposal. Um, but that's probably not atypical um, of a response. Um, we certainly had a, a large number of people that uh, we, we use an online platform, um, which also tells us about the number of visitors to the project and the number of visitors um, far outweighed the actual number of comments um, and depending what your feeling is around uh, people that are informed um, it, t it tends to be the, the the sort of people that feel more strongly about objecting that follow through with an objection in our experience. Thank you very much. Councillor Dixon. Thank you chairman. Um, when I see solar farms from above they tend to look to my mind as a lot of solar panels on the field. Now, essentially, there is possible archaeological impact and therefore such could be impacted when the a uh, solar farm is constructed. I was just wondering, in actual fact, how much construction, how much ground movement is there in actual fact in creating this? And also, um, obviously, we've heard about the site plans, uh, site lines, and I wondered when it's all set up, are there many vehicle movements? Because I would again anticipate it's something that you know generates electricity when the sun shines. Um, and also we've heard of obviously the concerns regarding glyphosate, um, which I equate with Roundup, though I dare say um, industrial and business users possibly might have something a bit more stronger than, than Roundup to use. Um, but we've seen that there are new hedgerows to be planted. I believe it is intention, obviously, to plant grass under the panels when it's all sorted, if sorted, etc. Um, so what would be your anticipation of the biological benefits, if any, uh, should we be minded to uh, to grant the uh, the request? Yeah, thank you. Um, several great questions. Um, so happy, happy to answer those. I'll, I'll do my best to, to, I think, recall them all. But um, so archaeology, firstly, yes, it's something we tend to find is for, for every site we look at. Um, there's a there's a process that we go through in terms of investigating um, and it can be multi-layered. So initially there's a desk based assessment here, uh, followed by a geophysical survey. Um, if we're fortunate enough to receive an approval, there will be further work in the form of uh, most likely in the form of trial trenching. Um, so, but to date, what we've uh, learned is that um, through the geophysical survey in particular, it shows certain areas where there are where there's more prevalence of um, significant features and those have con uh, subsequent to that, they have been excluded from the scheme. So um, and then in terms of like, more general impacts on archaeology, um, essentially you're looking at um, its piling for the for the steel framework. So what unlike, say, a housing estate, for instance, we're, we're not concreting huge areas or excavating large areas. So so there's always scope. There's, I guess, minimal damage in that respect and scope to adjust around those features just to give you some comfort. Um, 
in terms of vehicles if that was more around trip generation generally to the site so so once one of the things with solar uh, is that once construction is complete um generally you're looking at between three four vehicles perhaps uh, a week um, and that will typically be a car or possibly a transit van or something similar um so so very limited um ongoing maintenance visits um in terms of the glycophosate um uh, that, that was that was obviously mentioned. Um, it, look, it really depends. There are a number of ways of managing sites, um, and it, you know there are. We're, we're always looking at. So what we actually look after about twenty percent of the UK solar farms from an asset management and operations and maintenance point of view. So of course, if a substance is banned, then clearly that 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 wouldn't be used anyway. Um, we're always looking for improvements in the in the way that sites can be managed. Um, one one of the things on this site we actually make provision for sheep grazing so one of the weird things we're actually looking at is sheep predominantly keeping a lot of the the, the, the grassland down um, and in terms of I mean believe it or not we actually have beehives on sites that we that we operate so um, we actually produce our own honey um, and uh, biodiversity net gain has has long been an issue for us that that um, and we've always believed that that we can deliver significant gains through these projects. Um, you may be familiar that the environment bill um, that that's coming in this year is looking um, for all development of all types to provide a ten percent target for biodiversity net gain, and one of the really good things. Okay, um, but we see it as a, a positive just around biodiversity net gain is we're able to now capture that. Um, and just from looking at two sites so far where this has started to be asked for, we're running at about 40 to 50% on average biodiversity net gain. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Crump beat you to it. Matt, I'll let him go first. Age before beauty, Matt. <laughs> um, yeah, very briefly. Um, sounds like you've got a lot of experience in, in this. Microphone, microphone's gone off. Battery. That's better. No, it's all right. I think my battery's all right. Uh, the um, one of the uh, objectors mentioned migratory birds and um, the issue. Um, reflection at night from moonlight, etc. Um, and I think in her words, um, will I land or re refuel potentially causing injuries to the birds and panel damage? Um, if you've got any experience on that, and if you do, what mitigating mitigation do you put in place, please? Yeah, and it's another good question. Um, uh, the, the reality is solar is still a relatively new technology, but but certainly in our experience, it's not something we've seen a particular problem with. Um, we um, we have sites near estuaries and and um, wetland areas as well, so it's something that we um, for those projects there are sometimes areas of mitigation we can provide in the form of things like hedgerows to just break up the appearance of vast areas of solar, for instance. Um, and one of the things with this site it is broken down already into sort of several smaller uh, fields rather than one sort of single large field so those types of features tend to be the things that actually helps create uh, create the, the the awareness that 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 that, that there is you know that that, it, that birds don't tend to be uh, attracted in that respect uh, Councillor Jennings I'll try and get through this quickly just two questions for you how many houses will this provide energy for? Um, and the second question is, and I looked on the off-gen uh, figures about um, energy su uh, supply, and it looked like 74% was gas and coal, 20% nuclear, and only 4% is of renewables. That was a couple of years ago. Couldn't find up-to-date details. How much is supplied by the renewables or solar sector now? Yep. So um, just just on the first point, so um, the number of houses uh, is around about sixteen and a half thousand. Um, 
in terms and the second point just in terms of um in terms of energy it, it, it's it, it's it's been growing year on year so the wider renewable energy industry um is probably typically 30 percent um or, or but it's it started to exceed coal um in certain years it's been exceeding nuclear generation as well so renewables as a whole is significant and solar is um one of the uh, well the significant part of that alongside both onshore and offshore wind Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Curtis, you want to go again? Um, just very quickly, if I may. Um, so that it's, it'll provide, and it's following Councillor Jennings' point, um, 16,500 homes. We should all be playing our part in supporting renewables. Will, does this electricity go into the national grid, though? It's, I think just for clarification on that point, please. Yeah, of course. Again, another good question. So. Um, in terms of how it works, the, the project is connected into Western Power Distributions Network, which is the network which you will all, uh, which, which everyone is connected to locally. Um, the connection point that was talked about is the substation at Harbury, um, just up the road. Um, what we, we've, we've basically moved away from a transmission based system with lots of large power stations. So one of the things that all, we are we are all living with a lot more localized projects such as this, they connect in at that local level and the power is, tends to be used closest to where the demand is in the first instance. So uh, if there's less demand, it may go further afield, but, it, but it's not the case that it, it, it like a transmission based power station that it's designed to go 100 miles to you know, Manchester or, or, or beyond. Uh, just a question. I, I, well, I'll come back to you in a minute, Peter. Just what I want to get at. Um, I, people say, and it's hearsay, that uh, these solar farms, um, they give off a hum or a noise or whatever else. Can you clarify what kind of a noise or whether it's a nuisance value or what it is, please? <laughs> Yeah, uh, okay, so um, the only thing that really makes any noise on a solar farm are, are the inverters. So uh, an inverter is what essentially converts the DC power that's generated by the panels into, into AC so that it can be exported into the grid. Um, and the, within those inverters, you also have a transformer. Um, so they're in containerized units um, and they tend to be sited and we've designed them to be fairly central within the site so that um, the, the, the the, the panels essentially provides a noise attenuation uh, filter to that as well. So as and as you get further and further away, um, once you're around the periphery of the site, you're generally down to levels which is pretty similar to a whisper in a library. So um, whilst it's louder in the very centre of the site, if you were stood next to an inverter, um, when you're on the periphery, it's not it's barely audible. Councillor Henger Seraphin. Thank you, Chair. Just a quick uh, question. Um, figures I've got here said there's four and a half miles of fencing. What type of fencing is it? Yeah, so um, fencing wise, we use a two meter high post and wire fence. So sort of a, like a deer stock, uh, if you're familiar with. Um, so not sort of palisade or, or high security fencing or anything of that nature. They're not solid panels. No, so no, this is this is post and wire. So so fa and with fairly large um, sort of uh, uh, sections of within the the actual wire. So so fairly visible through. Okay, thank you. Councillor Mills, do you want to go? Yeah, yeah. thanks, Michelle. Um, yeah, just my benefit. Are are the um, is it more efficient in the summer than the winter? I mean, I'm when we've got sunny or bad weather. Yeah. Yeah, so, so absolutely. Um, it, it, so solar farms will generate on overcast days, um, but there's just simply more daylight uh, and sun, essentially sun hours in the summer months. So, so it, it, it's it's it, over a season if you sort of imagine a sort of a bell curve for production. Um, but even on some clear winter days, you can still get a reasonable amount of production. But 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 yes, absolutely, it's it's more geared around summer. Thank you very much. Any further questions? No? OK, thank you very much. You're now sort of free to go. Our uh, next speaker is ward member 
Councillor Chris Kettle. Councillor, you have five minutes. We'll give you a warning at this, when you're getting close. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Right. Climate change is a crisis that this council and I recognise, along with the need for renewable energy. And I, I personally have eight acres of solar panels on my farm. However, we should not have a new re jerk reaction to support every renewable energy application in this district. Instead, we need to respond in a measured way. I object to this application for three reasons. The loss of a significant area of productive agri agricultural land, scale and the visual impact to a historic landscape. In 2019, HSBC reported that 8% of our food is imported, including meat and vegetable oil from the Southern Hemisphere and Sainsbury's selling onions grown in New Zealand, all of which could be grown in the UK. What is the carbon footprint of land from New Zealand or South America? Meanwhile, we have a growing population of which 11% according to the UN are starving. It is equally critical for the UK to source and grow food sustainably. Yet between April and September 2020, 127 new large-scale solar farms were opened in the UK. In my county division, there are already three solar farms of 151 acres with a capacity of 29 megawatts out of 11 in the whole district. If this and two other large-scale farms proposed in Harbury are approved, the area lost in the Felden division alone will be 790 acres. According to the Department of Ah, now it's back on. Well, mine is back on anyway. Right. It is now. It is now back on. Okay. I didn't touch it. It just. Right. Where are we time wise? Um, in... Right. Renewables already provided 43% of the UK electricity and now generate more electricity than fossil fuels. In 2020, Wind generated 49% of our renewable energy, biomass plants 26% and solar only 10%. Why does this matter? Because the footprints of wind and biomass plants are negligible, but solar takes over hectares of land that we can ill afford to use. Sheffield University published a study in 2017 that showed the, in the UK, non-irrigated arable land now only represents 20%, 27% of the UK land mass. Arable land is a valuable resource we need to feed this nation, and wind and biomass plants are far more effective generators of renewable energy than solar. This may be grade B land, but as is most Warwickshire, it is not unproductive land and has been successfully and continually cropped for many years. In terms of policy, CS2 says measures to mitigate the impact of climate change will include direct, directing development of sustainable locations. CS3 says provision will be made for a range of renewable energy to maximise environmental, social and economic benefit, whilst minimising any adverse local benefits and the overall balance should be positive for local communities. Where the proposal affects a listed building, the Cotswold AONB or non-designated heritage and cultural assets, the objective of the designation must not be compromised by the development. Further, solar development will be assessed against agricultural activities the openness and character of the landscape and visual amenity and the character of the historic landscape. This site stretches one and a half miles by half a mile wide. It faces and is overlooked by the Burton Dasset Hills Country Park, including a listed Norman church, 15th century Beacon Tower, Anglo-Saxon cemetery, and is adjacent to the Iron Age Grendanton Hill Fort. The park attracts thousands of visitors every year. The applicant's own planning statement states the proposal is extensive in scale and the solar panels will be highly visible in the landscape. The proposal will temporarily change the rural character and appearance of the business, uh, of, of, the, um, of local viewpoints and from long distances, including the Burton Dasset Country Park and the Cotswold AOMB. The scale of the proposal could significantly change the rural appearance. Inspector Cook refused an appeal for a solar farm at Deppers Bridge within my ward, commenting that the PPG recognised that the de develop deployment of large-scale solar farms can have a negative effect on the rural environment, particularly in undulating landscapes. His reason for refusal was the harm to the landscape overweighed the benefits of the solar farm. 
Inspector Parsons allowed an appeal at Blackwell, um, referring to the council's landscape sensitivity study, which states that Feldham farmland has sensitivity to solar development where it is open and close to adjacent hillsides, allowing intervisibility. This includes the Cotswold A, O, and B. In conclusion, the generation of the right renewable energy is an important part of the climate agenda, but this application with the country park, the AONB overlooking the site, taking a very large area of arable land, well in excess of the 25 hectares you've heard about previously, is an application in the wrong place and more importantly, the wrong size. And it looks directly at a country park, which is regularly visited by very many people. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anybody have any questions for Councillor Kettle? Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Kettle, um, as a, uh, an agricultural uh, farmer, I believe, um, sheep, um, there was mention made that they could possibly use sheep on this land as well as the solar panels. Have you any experience in that area and have you any uh, information and knowledge that you could part to us as to the effectiveness of grazing sheep amongst solar panels and the appeal at Deppers Bridge? Do you know the date of that? I'm just wondering if it was prior to the core strategy or prior to the declaration of climate change. I can answer the latter um, easily. It was before the core strategy was actually adopted, but whilst this core strategy was still being developed and therefore was a planning consideration at the time, uh, how much weight was put on it, I cannot recall. Um, the second Blackwell application was more recent uh, and I think was post core strategy. Um, Mr. Barker might comment on that. I, I can't quite remember, but the, that's the appeal date. I think it was 2017 on that one. I can't quite remember the appeal date on the on the um, Deppers Bridge one. Um, in terms of sheep, um, this has been arable land for 40 years. Um, there is a sign, as I've said, I have a solar panel, which is not mine. It's Royal Burn Institution. There is a large sign when the when we have visitors with the pictures of sheep. Um, I have never seen um, or had any um, request by that particular developer to put sheep on the land. Um, it is mown uh, on a regular basis to solely with the purpose of keeping grass from growing in front of the panels. Um, it is a popular idea that sheep can be grazed, but sheep also chew metal cables, uh, sheep chew plastic. Uh, and these are incredibly expensive bits of equipment, um, added to which you have transformers, et cetera, et cetera, uh, with large signs saying keep away. And as far as I'm aware, sheep can't read. Um, there will be solar parks which do have sheep grazing on them without doubt, but the vast majority of them are maintained by professional mowing companies or, or ground maintenance companies uh, who go along uh, and know them. I mean, I do my little bit on behalf, and the standards they require are incredibly high. Um, so, yes, theoretically, you're right, but this is traditionally arable land and has been arable land for 40 years. It gets very wet in the winter, uh, as we know, which if the plots of crops are planted before then, isn't a problem. But it means you cannot put um, cloven hoofed animals on there because they will just uh, they'll get foot rot. Thank you, Councillor Dixon. Thank you very much, Councillor Kettle. Thank, Thank you. Chairman, to um, try to answer Councillor Kettle's question about um, dates, uh, he was quite right. The Deppers Bridge. Uh, decision was in 2014. I'm afraid I don't have the date for the decision on the appeal, but the decision to refuse uh, the Deppers Bridge application was made by this council in April 2014. So the, the court strategy was evolving at that time. And the Blackwall one, the decision was made by this council in March 2015. So yet again, the, the core strategy was evolving at this time, but it hadn't been adopted at this time. And certainly, obviously, the 
the, the climate change emergency policy had not been adopted at that time. Thank you, Mr. Barker. Thank you. It's gone off again. How do we go? Um, clarification points for the officer. Anybody have any other any questions for the officer? No. Ah, it's stunned. Go on, Councillor Mills. Yeah, I was going to say, it's, Louise did a good job then. I thought you uh, no, she's doing a very good job. Um, Louise, I just wanted, could you put the photos up from the view from Burton Lesset Hills for me, please? Good. I think Louise can actually zoom in on that if it helps, Jim. Oh, here we go. Oh, that's better, isn't it? Right. What are you doing? Can you can you run your cursor over where the it will be? So that's the year five. This is year one. I can't see the difference. Mm -hmm. Yes, you get that's, that's, that's even better. Can you do a game form, please? The, the cursor on that. Show the width. Um, here. So this is night kit bottom. Yeah. Around here. Okay. What you're looking oh, for? Actually, is... sorry. What, what I should say. Um, point of clarification. This area here. That was field nine. This was uh, provided prior to the applicants taking this section out. So please discount this. This will be green field. So actually, it's from here to here yeah field nine's gone uh, and that is still but that is still 200 acres yes it it's it's gone down to 58 points if it, uh, 56 point eight hectares of land with panels within it out of the 82. thank you obviously we've got some unused areas now Any further questions for the for the officer? No. OK, right. Members debate, do you want to? Councillor Dixon beat you to it, actually, but, we're, 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 but we'll, uh, you know, we'll start with Councillor Dixon. Tony, go on. Thank you, thank you Chairman. Um, certainly, obviously, we uh, we passed that climate change um, aim, target, etc. My own view on this one is that we do need to increase our renewable energy sources. And I also anticipate and see here that there are new hedge grows to be planted, which will again improve biodiversity of the area over and above that which is currently there. Understanding that it is arable uh, use at the present time, my anticipation is that arable will have some biodiversity and useful assistance etc regarding uh, life but i suspect that life is not quite as varied as it would be with hedgerows and other grass planting etc or could be as such um, i note the view from the burton dasset hills i'm a rambler it's not long since i was on top of there um, but uh, there's also the m40 uh, in view, etc. And as much as we can zoom in, um, my recollection of when we had to take photographs for um, purposes of viewpoints, etc., um, it had to be a standard for 50 mil lens or whatever, and no zooming in, etc. And therefore, um, I see it as a, a sliver of potential uh, silver light reflecting glass uh, at the distance of 
I think probably over two miles if it's three kilometers, something like that. Um, and therefore, um, there can be various developments within the countryside which will have uh, an initial detrimental impact. But ultimately, I can remember in our climate change discussions, um, one of our uh, councillors very forcibly said, there are some hard decisions to be made if we are going to meet our target. Tonight, it's a hard decision, but I favour the officer's recommendation of grant. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Councillor Dixon. Uh, Councillor Mills was next, and then we've got Councillor... Thank, thanks, Mr. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, yes, I, I did go and look at this from uh, several um, viewpoints. Um, uh, and I have to say, uh, for me, it is uh, vandalism on a, on a countryside in a grand scale. Uh, the impact on the land is, um, is in, for me, is quite enormous. Uh, the visual impact from AOMB, um, it, without doubt, you can see it. Um, I'm sure there's other place we can put these uh, these panels, but for me, in this particular part of uh, of Warwickshire, it is um, vandalism on a grand scale. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Mills. Councillor Curtis. Thank you, Chair. Um, certainly, actually, I tend to agree with Councillor Mills on. I mean, this is a an extremely large industrial unit. Um, I think uh, solar farm is a slightly misleading term but I, I was particularly interested in the comments from Councillor Kettle on the loss of land for agricultural purposes we we do have a climate emergency yes the council has adopted that absolutely but it's not just about energy generation and I think we should consider really seriously the loss of agricultural land. If we are increasingly reliant on importing food from halfway around the world, there is a massive impact on climate change. So I think that does need to be taken into consideration very carefully. Um, I'm certainly not against renewable energy. I think it was interesting to hear that only 10% of renewables in the UK come from solar. Um, and for me, particularly the scale of this, um, I just think is out of proportion. As it's as, as been said, um, sorry, I, I, it's a point I made earlier on. Um, uh, the Council's Renewable Energy Landscape Sensitivity Study for the, this area in scale and location, it exceeds the limit of landscape sensitivity framework by 250% of breach of policy CS3. It is the scale that really concerns me. And I think, as I say, um, Councillor Kettle's comments are worth listening to, as always, Councillor Kettle. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Curtis. Uh, Councillor Jennings. Um, to me, cl the climate emergency means we need more renewable energy. Uh, this is going to provide energy for 16,500 homes. Um, there's always going to be some sort of quid pro quo or drawback or balancing act um, when you have to make these decisions. But in order to achieve clean energy, in my view, it's something which we which we, really, we have to do. As much as we may not want to, we have to do it. Um, and I've I've driven past a lot of these, and I went down to Cornwall a couple of weeks ago, and I've driven past a few of them there. And I personally don't find solar panels offensive in any way. I quite like seeing them, wouldn't I? but uh, I think it's sort of, I'd rather see that than a, some coal-fired power station being built somewhere or in any other form of um, unrenewable energy. Um, we're not losing, we wouldn't be losing it to agriculture. Uh, sheep farming is agriculture. Um, we're talking about having to bring food in from all around the world. Well, we're talking, New Zealand was mentioned. Well, have a guess what we bring in from New Zealand? Sheep. So if we've got sheep farming here, it's sort of, we're not losing anything. Um, and again, it's for a 40 year license, um, this application. Um, I'm sure with, when technology changes, I mean, it may well be before then that they decide to, to get rid of it because there's another form of cheaper 
um, energy source. Um, so it could revert back to crop farming, in, when I say in, as an arable farming before that date, but it's not being lost to agriculture. It's still being used and could be used for agriculture with the, the sheep farming. So therefore, in, you say it's, it's hard decisions have to be made and you've got to balance this up and on my balance, I'd balance up, I'd, I agree with the officer's recommendation and I'm happy to propose that uh, we go ahead and grant this application. Thank you very much, Councillor Jennings. Councillor Henry Serafin. Thank you, Chair. I agree with uh, Councillor Mills and Councillor Curtis. I have reservations of using up agricultural land when there could be possibility of other sites. I've looked at this over a number of years and if you take a car park where Tesco supermarket is, you could cover that as a roof with solar panels. And it wouldn't have any detrimental effect because it's not taking up any more room. There's lots of car parks like that, industrial sites as well. So um, I agree with the Councillor Mills and Councillor Curtis that this is too much to lose on agricultural land. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Dix. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Jennings has proposed a grant. Um, I would second that proposal. Thank you, Councillor Dixon. OK, so we have a, a motion to grant. Um, from my perspective, um, it's balance. And uh, I'm, I'm very finely balanced. I'm not sure where where I particularly want to go with this. And listening to these debates, it doesn't make it any easier for me because looking at the six people around here, we, you know, we're, we're almost in a 3-3. So um, I think what we'll do is we'll move to a vote and uh, and see where we go with that. So the, most, the, 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 the proposal we've got is that uh, we grant in line with the officer's recommendation. So uh, can we have a show of votes, please? All those in favour? That's two, Chairman. Thank you. All those against? That's three, Chairman. Three against. Abstention. Abstain. It's two abstentions. What I, can I propose? Sorry, I, I propose that we fuse this um, due to the impact on the land and openness. Can we do that? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Chairman, um, if you're considering refusing this application, you must have reasons why you feel the application doesn't meet with your policies. So I, I think what I'm hoping to hear from members um, before we, we start to talk about a reason for refusal is how the harms that they've identified relate back to your policies. Um, and I, I think we need to draw more out of what has already been said so that I can I can help you to draft your reasons for refusal. Okay. Sorry, that's really all I can say. Well, thank you. I'm, I, I mean, I'm saying for my part, um, uh, the impact on the land uh, is in a on a grand scale. Um, it's just the impact. I mean, I, I, I say I, I view this from several viewpoints and trying to imagine it, it looks horrendous. So it, it, for me, it's the impact on the land itself. Thank you. Perhaps is that I, I wonder, good enough? 
yeah, I'll tell you what we're going to I think what we're going to do here, Chairman, yeah. is we're going to have a look at policy CS3. How about that? Let's have a look at CS3. I'll get it up on the screen. Uh, and then you can see how you think this application relates to policy CS3. Uh, this could take me a moment. Please bear with me. Because I haven't got the core strategy open. There's plenty there, Mr. Chairman. What was that? You just bear with us while we find the right piece of information, please. Got a hard Would you like to read it from? Uh, no, I think I can see it. Oh, no, right. Uh, unless, um, Obviously, I'm happy to take whatever members want to tell me, but I'm trying to help you to formulate your reason by showing you what what I, I understood from the debate. You can't get it up controlling get it on the screen. It'll be a second or two. Oh, okay. right. um, oh, brilliant. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. Who did that? That's better. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> so if you go through to the next page, whoever's controlling this, yeah. here we go. Yeah. We start to talk about solar energy yeah. and we start to talk about the criteria that we're going to use to judge solar proposals yeah. against. Um, there you go. Impact on agricultural activities and disturbances to agricultural land, impact on openness and character of the landscape, impact on the character of the historic landscape, trees, enhanced biodiversity and direct and reflected lighting. So help me with that. P pull something out of that. Um, Councillor Mills, oh. you said the impact on the lands. Um, I, I, I know that we will be tested on that phrase in the future. Uh, um, it, uh, what sort of impact on the lands? Do you mean the impact it, from the, the foundations uh, this, on I the mean, ecology? This um, paragraph here, isn't that, isn't that good enough? That so you simply feel that it, it fails on all of those counts? Well, I, I would say so. That it's going to have an impact on the current sheep grazing on the land, that it's going to have an impact on the openness. Imp impact on. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I would say all that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Curtis is going to second your proposal. I think, can I just. Chair, I think our members would, should maybe focus on the second bullet point is what I'm hearing. I think impact on openness and character of the landscape and visual amenity. That seems to me to be the main concern rather than some of these other points. OK, if, if, that, if you're happy. OK, with that. yeah. OK, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ross. Right. So we've got a proposal from Councillor Mills. who have been seconded by Councillor Curtis. Can we go for a vote on to uh, to refuse then please it's in favor that's three in three. favor of refuse all those against uh, all those against please two against yes. any abstentions that's two abstentions chairman i know so Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My God. Yeah, Applic application number 20 bleak 02839 stroke FQL has been refused. Thank you. That was hard work. It's easier than I expect, to be honest. Um, can we just clear a break? Yeah. So give me just a couple of minutes break. OK, we're going to adjourn just for a couple of minutes. That was quite a long drawn out one. We'll uh, have a couple of minutes and then we'll start again.
Right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to move on to item five. Item two zero, oblique stroke 03585. Let me get the number right here. Uh, lock up garages, Hodgson Road, Stratford on Avon. I invite the planning officer, Amy Flute, to present the application. Thanks, Amy. Thank you, Chairman. The application site and um, represented by the black dot on the map is a former garage site within the defined built up area boundary of Stratford. Outline planning permission is sought within the area edged red for up to five dwellings, including demolition of existing garages and the redevelopment of the existing hard standing. and one two bed house with amenity space. The existing access of Hodgins Road would be utilised, parking and turning would be provided to the south of the site as well as a pedestrian link to the existing footpath to the east. Looking in a southeasterly direction from Hodgins Road, the site's access can be seen. The image on the left shows the access road as it curves to the left on the immediate approach to the garage site, as you are within the site, and the image on the right shows the curve in the opposite direction if you were to exit the site. This image is taken within the site looking in a northwesterly direction. The access road can be seen as can the relationship of the site with the neighbouring properties that front onto Hodgson's Road. Now looking in a northeasterly direction, the existing garages can be seen. Again, the relationship of the site with neighbouring properties on Maple Grove can also be seen. The eastern boundary of the site is now being shown. There is an existing pedestrian footpath which links the site between Hodgson's Road, Maple Grove and Kennet Close. This image is taken from the access looking in a northwesterly direction towards Hodgson's Road as you exit the site. And finally, these images show Hodgson's Road from the access point. Members, please be aware of the updates on the update sheet. It, um, in officer's view, it has not been demonstrated that there is a safe and suitable access to the site for all users. Chairman, the recommendation is to refuse the application based on highway concerns as detailed within the committee report. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Um, we've a couple of speakers on this one. Uh, first speaker is Mr. Mike Jones, who's the agent. You've got three minutes, Mr. Jones, and uh, we'll give you a 30 second warning of when your time's about to run out. Thank you. Right, OK, thank you. Um, the officer's report is fairly comprehensive and I don't really want to go through any aspect of it. I think it's safe to say that there is one uh, issue which has been raised, which uh, Amy um, referred to right at the end, and that is the highway access. Um, my concern really here is that I have a disagreement with the Highway Authority and particularly how it has conducted itself and how it keeps changing its view. In the consultation response it originally set out on the 11th of February, it actually had, although it raised an objection, it was purely on the grounds of refuse. Um, and in terms of the access, it said the application site has been used historically for the parking of vehicles. Therefore, the existing access route has encountered significant use. The proposal will result in lower or comparable vehicle, vehicle movements then that would be generated in full use of the garages. The access width is suitable. We then came further on to April and May when uh, uh, Amy tried to contact the Highway Authority and the Highway Authority sent various emails. I don't need to go through them. They're in the committee report. But the Highway Authority basically has changed its position. First of all, claiming that there was a public footpath going through the site. 
we did check this right at the beginning. There is no public right of way and the right of way officer has no objection. What seems to be the case is that there is a highway maintained at the public expense, which is unbeknown to us and unbeknown also to the district council. Who are who actually are the owners of the site and were the uh, the or were the owners of the site who sold it to my client. Um, the situation now has moved on. The, the highway authority we had to do road safety audits. The road safety audits found no issues, but the highway authority have taken issue with the width of the access, which obviously Amy has shown. Uh, the access that you saw actually has vegetation on one side, which will be removed, so the width actually will be increased. So having found that the access width and the the number of vehicles moving was satisfactory in February, the latest position on the 30th of July from the Highway Authority is completely opposite. And in putting that forward, it actually now says that there will be intensification of use. The problem is, so it seems to have gone off. <laughs> the problem Good is second. that the Highway Authority have completely discounted the historic use of the site and are assuming that the site is vacant and has no vehicle activity, which of course is complete nonsense. It, you, can't, you can't compare uh, um, the proposed use with the site which is now vacant. The site is vacant because Orbit sold it and the garages obviously are not used. So my position is that the highway authority's position is, is uh, muddled and is wrong and there are no other reasons for refusal. You had a time, Mr. Thank you. <clears throat> right. Anybody have any questions for Mr. Jones? Mr. Councillor Mills will be to it. We'll go with him first. Councillor Mills. Thank. Hi. Hello, Mr. Jones. Um, you, you say that the um, access is going to be widened. Um, by how much? Uh, I should know. Uh, it's about a metre and a half. I think it's uh, it's the, the hedge which is going down the side. The actual property was owned by the garages were owned by Orbit. The the access and the uh, hard standing were, were owned by the uh, district council. Now it's all owned by my, my client. Um, Orbit also owned the house on the left hand side. Um, so, but the council's ownership includes the hedge and that goes down the left hand side as you're looking at it. So that would be removed to widen the access. Uh, Councillor Dixon was next, I think. Thank you, Chairman. Um, basically, I was, it was the same topic. So, um, uh, Mr. Jones, basically, that hedge that we're seeing there uh, is not on the ownership and the property that we can see that house it belongs on the driveway on the left hand side that's correct yes oh, thank you any other questions for mr jones Councillor curtis well, thank you i'm sorry this is on the same point but do we know or can you say what the width of that driveway would be were that hedge to be removed because i think that's fairly critical sorry thank you it's a very good question and I should have the answer. I, I, I think it's in the, <clears throat> if I'm not mistaken, it was actually commented in the committee report, which I'm trying to get to. <coughs> From memory, I think it's a, I think it's a one and a half metres, but, uh, but I, I'd have to, uh, we've got a topographical survey which basically picks it up. So the, uh, the, the actual ownership boundary is, is a, is a, um, um, a a fence behind the hedge, if that makes sense. But I don't have on me, I apologise, the exact width of the access drive once you've removed the hedge. It's certainly in the information we supplied to uh, to Amy as the planner. Yeah, I think Amy's got it on the plan. It's shown as three and a half metres. So, Mr. Jim, that is that is the finished size, is it? Right, thank you.
Next speaker is the ward member, Councillor Foytek. Councillor Foytek, you've got five minutes and we'll give you a 30 seconds warning when you're approaching the time. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'm speaking to um, support the planning officer's um, recommendation to refuse this application um, and also that WCC Highways have made an objection because of the um, size of the access. I, I just really just want to give you a little bit of historical sort of sort of background to, to the area really. It's somewhere where I've lived all my life, so I know it very well. And um, the garages were first put in about 40 years ago um, and they were used as garages, but over a period of time, they actually became sort of plate lockups where people would take storage. So there'd be perhaps one or two car movements in a week. So it's, it, over the decades, the car movements have reduced. However, Thomas Jolly School at the very top, their main entrance, um, uh, you, I don't think you can see it in the pictures there, but if you go the, the alleyway that takes you up past Maple Grove and Kennet Close, it actually brings all the a lot of the children that actually go to school out to the entrance of the school. So for the past 30 years, my own children have been there. So for the last 30 years, the school's doubled in size. Um, movements of children has increased over those years as well. Not only that, Tesco has developed a back entrance, which leads to a lot of parents parking at Tesco. They're encouraged to walk their kids to school. And so they go through the back of Tesco, through this, this very narrow entrance to this alleyway and then on to school. Um, and in fact, on the uh, 14th of July, one of the residents actually pictured everybody that used that for a half hour period between 3.15 and 3.45. And there are 122 movements. So that's children on bikes, on scooters. Uh, the way kids sort of move around, they sometimes walk into school on their own. Um, and, and as they come out of that very tight entrance, right opposite is a play area. So there's a great incentive for, for the um, for the kids to use the alleyway and it's it's actively encouraged so to actually put a building there with a shared the only way you could actually use that entrance to access housing is to share the carriageway um, whereby really if you're going to use it it would be in my 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 humble opinion that you'd probably need a separate pathway and the road to access otherwise um, I don't think it will be safe. And that's that's pretty much where I'm at. If you've got any questions, please, please ask any questions. Thank you, Councillor Foytek. And we've got any questions? No, no questions. You get off lightly. Thank you, uh, Thank you very much. Take your leave. I might Thank get you. an early night then. Yeah. Councillor Mills, points of clarification. Thank you. Yes, please. Um, uh, oh. Sit somewhere else. That's better. Um, Amy, uh, to, to put a, a roadway, let, let's say that that's um, entrance of a car, so it's going to be used. Would we legally need a footpath? Thank you.
Um, that's something that I'm not um, 100% sure on myself. Highways haven't picked up in, um, haven't obviously said that in their comments. I don't know if Dale's got anything he can add to that at all as to whether we, whether we would legally need um, to have a footpath alongside. I really wish we've got a highway engineer here. Um, Jim, you'll be aware that we on, on large housing layouts, we regularly bring schemes to you where five houses, maybe as many as nine or ten houses operate off a shared surface, yeah. which is, is shared by pedestrians and by vehicles. Yeah. Uh, they're designed to be sufficiently wide to have sufficient visibility so that and obviously to operate at sufficiently slow speeds that both vehicles and people can can use them safely together. Uh, so I think the answer to your question is it is possible to do that. Uh, the Highway Authority have clearly concluded that it's not possible to do that in this instance. Does that answer the question? Did the best I could. Sort of. Uh, Councillor Dixon, I think, was first. Yeah, see, it's sneaked in behind you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Amy, um, is there a minimum distance that uh, we should be looking at for, as it were, one way traffic? Because that's obviously a narrow entrance, even with the removal of that hedge. And uh, uh, obviously, we are assured it belongs to the council and not that owner who has probably been trimming it for a number of years in that adjacent house. Um, but essentially, I'm looking at uh, what happens when one vehicle is exiting and another vehicle is trying to get in. Um, obviously, there's no um, passing points. It's pretty narrow and it looks fairly long. Um, I just wondered if you could give us the exact length and whether or not it is too long for single carriageway. OK, I can I can measure off the length of the access for you um, in a moment, but I think the, the one of the um, highways um, objections within the update sheet may actually answer the question. So they've said that the access is of, is of insufficient width at the junction with Hodgson Road to enable vehicles travelling in the opposite direction to pass. This could lead to head on type collisions or a vehicle reversing out onto a live footway carriageway, which could lead to vehicle and pedestrian conflicts resulting in injuries. The highway authority would require the access to be constructed to a minimum width of five metres for the first 7.5 metres as measured from the near edge of the public highway carriageway. Thank you, Amy. Thank you very much, Chairman. Councillor okay, Jennings. Thanks. So, uh, Amy, I think that a lot of what I was going to ask was the same. Um, so, therefore, that it needs to, be, needs to be five, but it's actually three and a half. The other thing was that the Do we have? Yep. Um, so County um, Council Rights of Way have um, stated that there's no um, designated public footpath, but there is um, a footpath which appears to run through the site, which um, as the ward member was referring to, um, which connects the site, Maple Grove, can it's close, um, and then runs, allows people to access through the site onto Hodgson's Road. Um, which from the highways comments, which suggests that it is um, highway managed, it's um, highway managed at public expense. So if I go back to my photos, so this this is the site access Hodgson's Road. Um, and then when you get into the site, um, so then this is where the road on the left curb would curve round. Um, then this is obviously the central part of the site. And then um, the footpath then, which is existing, which connects up um, to Kennett's Close um, and goes up to the, the top road, um, can then be seen, which is there at the moment. OK, any other question? I've got a question, if I may.
Um, so with regards to refuse, there were um, there was an objection um, and refuse collection, if members were minded to approve, could potentially be um, dealt with by a condition um, for a refuse strategy to, strategy to arrange an alternative form of refuse collection from the site where we could get the details of the size of the vehicles, the times to ensure that something could fit comfortably. Um, I can show you a um, tracking plan that's being provided, which shows for an ambulance and um, um, a, a fire um, tender vehicle. Um, I'm not sure whether the size of the vehicle is what it, what serves the site. Um, so obviously you can see see from that um, the tra the tracking into and out of the site. Um, highways have um, obviously made comment um, in their numerous. Um, consultation responses about obviously how the site needs to be able to be accessible to a variety of, of vehicles. Um, and um, in their most recent objection, they have um, stated um, obviously how there is the potential for um, conflict between vehicles and how it hasn't been demonstrated that a safe and suitable access to the site can be achieved for all users. For, for clarity, Chair, Chair, if I may, um, emergency vehicles tend to find a way. You know, um, whatever the conditions, emergency vehicles tend to find a way. Uh, refuse collection, the, the position is very simple. The council's uh, street cleaning people have said they will not collect refuse from here. So the only way that refuse can be collected is by a private arrangement. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure that was clear in, in Amy's answer, but that's correct, isn't it? Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Anybody got any further questions? Ah, Councillor Crum. Yeah, so just a point of clarification about the emergency vehicles. Um, at my portfolio at the county, I've got fire and rescue. And any delay, any can be vital. So I would like to ensure I take on point Mr Barker said that the fire engines, fire appliances would get there, but any delay can be vital. So uh, that's that, that's one point I need to make sure we that, that we need to take that into account. So um, whilst I, I can understand Mr Barker's points and it is he's true that they will get there by hook or by crook or well, you can use that phrase these days, so apologies if it's the wrong phrase, but they will get there by any means. Um, but yeah, any any delay by a minute or two could be have tragic consequences. So therefore, I will make sure we, we are on the safe side of caution. Thank you very much, Councillor Crum. Any other questions now? OK, so now we've got a point of clarification. Move on to debate. Uh, oh, crikey, they're all good. Councillor Dixon, we'll go with you first. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, the officer's recommendation was to refuse. Uh, I would propose that it is refused in accordance with the officer's recommendation. Councillor Jennings, we'll move that. Uh, I'm quite happy to second that. Um, this is all about access. I know highways have changed their mind a number of times. As far as the actual five dwellings there, not a problem. I wouldn't have a problem with that at all. Uh, the, the problems, the access, I think the applicant probably needs to go back, try and sort out something with highways and then come back. Thank you, Councillor Jennings. Councillor Mills. Thanks, uh, Mr Chairman. Yeah, I, I'm just looking at the WC Highways objection and just to read it, this could lead to head on collisions, which Amy's read out, um, vehicles reversing out onto a live footway and and um, it said pedestrian conflicts resulting in injuries. If we if we were to grant this and there were injuries, we'd be held to pay. Okay. Uh, we really would. Um, we, as, a, as a council, we couldn't do it as an authority. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr Chairman. Yeah, taking into account Councillor Voychuk's points about safety, children using it, etc. And the 120 movements between 315 and 345. And also the objections from the county on the 19th of July and the 30th of September, uh, 30th of July. I've, I've not seen anything to make me go against officers' recommendations to review, so I will go along with uh, the proposal. Right, so we'll move to a vote. We've already got a proposer and a seconder. Uh, those in favour of 
refusing in line with the officer's recommendation. It's unanimous, Chairman. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, so I can now confirm that uh, application number 20 stroke 03585 stroke OUT has been defeated, has been agreed that uh, it will be refused. Right. Move to agenda item number six. Oh. Move to the item, uh, item agenda number six. Uh, application number 2002489 FUL, Riverside Caravan Park, Tiddington Road, Tiddington, Stratford on Avon. I invite the planning officer, Sarah McPherson, to present this application. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Chair. This application is at Riverside Caravan Park on Tiddington Road, just outside Stratford. It's identified here by the black dots in the centre of the map. This is the site in greater detail. It's important to note that parcel B and C outlined in blue on this map are excluded from the red line boundary. We're only concerned with parcel A. And here is the site when seen from above. That's about it for uh, images to show you. So back to this one. Um, the current lawful use of the site has been established. They can have 266 caravans of any type for seven months of the year between April and October. The proposal is to reduce the number of caravans to 180 and extend the occupancy period for 10 months of the year. That would be between March and January. Thank you, Chair. Oh, the recommendation is to approve. Thank you. Chair, before you proceed, can I draw members' attention specifically to the update sheet, page three, uh, and carrying over onto page four, where there is a request from uh, that the due to the ward member's serious medical condition uh, that the application is deferred to allow her to to be present and to uh, speak and give her her um, constituents views on the application uh, which is followed then by uh, some comments from the applicant explaining the difficulties that that would cause to him so request for deferral and response from the applicant both of which i think members should really read and understand before they proceed to debate. Thank you. Thank you. The only speaker we have on this is uh, Mr Nick Allen, the applicant. Um, if you'd like to come forward, Mr Allen, you have three minutes and we'll give you a 30 second warning when your time's running out. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, councillors. Uh, my name is Nick Allen. Um, I'm uh, the director of Avon Estates, which own the uh, holiday parks. We're probably one of the largest visitor accommodations in Stratford upon Avon. We have about 80,000 guests each year and 28 full members of staff who actually work on just these sites. Um, planning permission to operate as a caravan site at Riverside goes back to the 1970s. There's no planning condition to limit the type of number of caravans used for the land. It currently has a mix of touring and statics. A certificate of lawfulness demonstrated the physical capacity to at least 266, but it was limited to seven months of the year. Our other parks that we run, Avon Park and Raper Park, are all 10 months of the year. So during the last few years, with the increase of people staying in the UK holidays, demand have increased for better quality accommodation and week-long bookings. On the other hand, there's been a decrease in touring caravan bookings at Stratford-upon-Avon. Stratford Accordingly, this planning application seeks to limit the number of caravans to the size of up to 180, whilst increase the period of occupancy from seven to 10 months. The trade-off will equalise the flood risk to holiday makers, and there's no objection from the Environment Agency. There will be no change to the caravan site boundaries or further development of roads, hard signs or buildings. Visual impact will be reduced because fewer caravans will be spread across the sites. A longer holiday season will provide many public benefits. Riverside will employ more staff and ground maintenance, cleaners and management. Clubhouse income and staff is likely to increase. A longer season and a higher occupancy rate will benefit the tourism economy of Stratford-upon-Avon and Tiddington by the lengthening of our season. I therefore ask you to support 
the Office's Recommendation and Grant Planning Commission. Thank you very much, Mr. Allen. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for Mr. Allen? Councillor Dix. Mr. Allen, um, the officer didn't say what uh, parcels B and par parcel C are used for. Obviously, not part of the application site. Are they in? But they are in the ownership of Avon Estates. Uh, are there any caravans on those at all? I just wondered. Yeah, why, so why they're excluded to certain extent. So parcel B and parcel C, um, with under certificate of lawfulness, and they've got per planning permission for residential park homes for 365 days a year. Any other questions for Mr. Allen? Councillor okay, so Jennings. How dependent is your business um, from this extended holiday period? Um, I suppose our industry has gone through uh, a few changes in the last couple of years, especially, um, and with the pandemic. We'll, it's not the be all or end all of our world, but what has what it will produce is is uh, more customers coming will extend our season will allow us to run our parks probably more efficiently but the 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 way that the industry has gone now is um touring has um with the 56 day rule that the government put out has definitely been um spread out more farmers and anyone with land can actually now have a caravan site on their land um, so we have definitely seen a, a dip of interest on that and a massive increase for holiday homes for, for weekly bookings. So it is it is important to us. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Allen? Well, I'll, I'll, I will ask one as well. Um, we've had, a, you've heard uh, Mr. Barker talk about this potential deferral and whatever else. And you've made quite a strong statement about this potential deferral. Um, <clears throat> and just if you could just give us a very brief uh, explanation of why you've got to wait for two years if we if you don't get this uh, decided today. Um, it's we it's it's like a building site, I suppose. Um, that we we have to we, this won't be done by ourselves. These these lodges uh, or the bases put in. Um, we we'll have to get outside contractors to to come in and start. And as you can imagine, the industry is is manic. The the longer I put it off, the the longer time I'm not going to get ground crews to be able to come in and do it. Um, I have got uh, quotes done, and I've got hopeful start dates. But I, I can't put a spade in the ground um, unless the application gets gets put through, and it will put us back definitely to 2023, even probably longer. The industry is is manic at the moment, and also getting holiday homes. Um, you know, we have to put orders in. If we go and order some stuff now, it's getting delayed and delayed and delayed. And we all know that at the end of the day, we can't get building materials. It's the same for the caravan industry. We are struggling the same. Okay, thank you very much for that. Thank you. Oh, hang on, we've got another question. Councillor Dixon. Thank you, Chairman. Um, you just used the word lodges there, uh, Mr. Allen. Um, obviously, we know that there's touring caravans and static caravans. You've obviously got some park homes in parcels B and C. Are these lodges wheeled vehicles as a caravans or are they something more affixed? Um, with our, our, we've got a typical lawfulness for, for, for caravans. Uh, the lodges that I'm referring to are uh, caravans on wheels. So it comes under the same definition. It does, yes. Yeah. We can have either a static caravan with an alum, aluminium clad or we can go for a, a lodge effect uh, unit, which is more in keeping. Same unit. Because yeah. obviously a park home itself has to have a chassis. It needs to be mobile. A park home is a caravan, yeah. So it's yeah. the same unit, but we are, it just makes them that they, we, we try and do our, our developments all the same colour. It just makes it a lot more um, pleasing to the eye. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Allen. Yeah, uh, clarification from the officers. Thank you very much. Sorry, I had a 
brief lapse there, and I couldn't think what it was. Uh, clarification of the officers. Thank you, Chairman. Um, on the planning application and information, is a park home and caravan touring fixed the same animal? In other words, in reducing the number of statics and touring vans on the site of A, could they all become park homes without any further planning application having to be submitted if we approve this one this evening? At the moment, um, it's been established through the Lawful Development Certificate that they can have 266 caravans, that is of any type, that can be a touring vehicle or a static caravan. They would have to fit the legal definition of a caravan, which I think um, Ross is able to define further if you need further clarification. Um, but a, a static caravan, a park home type thing that does fit within that definition, they can have up to 266 of those. Um, the same parameters would apply under the planning application where they're requesting 180 of those. So there wouldn't be any change to the type of uh, unit they could have on site. It would just be the number which we're looking at today. Yes, if they fell within the legal definition of a caravan. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Dixon. Any other questions for the officer? No? Okay, then we'll move to debate. Now, um, as Dale's already said on the debate, we have a, a request um, on deferment on this, but let's debate first and then we can make a decision on, on what we're going to do when we've had a debate. Okay, then Councillor Jennings, you go on. Okay, then. I absolutely understand uh, the order. Sorry, sorry, Chair. I think it makes sense to decide whether you're deferring first before you debate. Yeah. yeah. Thank, thank you for that. Are there any calls for it to defer? Councillor Mill. Yes, Mr. Chairman. I, I would like this to be deferred um, until such time we can have the uh, ward member or ward members' representation to uh, come to committee. Thank you. Is that a proposal? That's a proposal. We have any seconders for that proposal? Councillor Hensley Seraphin, you're seconding. This is to give uh, Councillor Rolf, Rolf the opportunity. Uh, she's invested a lot of work in this, so this is to give her the opportunity to play her case. And uh, so I think what we'll do is we've got a proposal and a seconder. Uh, we'll go to a vote to Chair, defer. Chair, if I may, before you go to a vote, that's okay. a very open-ended resolution until such time as the ward member no. is able to attend or supply her, written, her representation. Yeah. That's, uh, can, I, we, can we nail that down a little bit tighter? Absolutely. Yeah, okay. That is very, very open. Okay. Yeah, yeah I, I, I thought that when I said it, <laughs> clearly, it's a bit open. Um, until we can, can we get this to uh, a committee quickly and by then i mean we don't know um well, we can get a how about delegating that decision to the chairman the chairman to negotiate not not this chairman the, the chairman of the committee mr richards councillor richards to negotiate with the ward member and to agree with the ward member a date when it can come back um wouldn't be appropriate, I don't think, for officers to have that responsibility, but it yeah, would be yeah. appropriate for the chairman to have it. Yeah. And he would obviously balance the, the needs of Mr. Allen against the needs of the ward member, and it would be his decision. Obviously, we'd give him advice. Sounds good to me. Let's do that. Okay. So, de delegate it to the, the, the full chairman. Delegate full chairman to negotiate with ward member and okay. forward with a date. Okay, so can we have a vote to go with that then, please? That's one, two, three, four, Chairman. Yeah, those against that. That this is. And that's three against, Chairman. So that okay. carried to defer. So carried to defer until uh, the, the proper committee chairman has a discussion with the ward member and take it forward from there. Just it's really just to clarify her recovery period is is just the one we can reschedule this. OK. Right, defer. Okay. 
Sorry for that minor delay. Agenda item seven two zero stroke oh three four four three stroke Barry Edencroft Fells Lane Napton on the Hill. Oh, Amy's gone. Okay, Thank you, it? Chair. All oh, right. <laughs> I invite Amy Flute to present, but she said, are you doing this one? I, I am. Please proceed, Louise. Right. Thank you. <laughs> You're doing a very good impression. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to need curlier hair, but other than that, we're fine. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, um, this application is in relation to um, a site in Napton on the Hill, which is identified by the black dot on the map. Uh, the site is located off Fells Lane, which is a single track road. This is Fells Lane here, identified, which links onto Dog Lane. Um, and this is the site here. So just looking up to the get, no, actually it's about to there. This is the access and this is the area of concern. Um, planning permission has been granted previously by committee for uh, the erection of a self-build three bedroom house, workshop and garaging. As you can see on the aerial photograph, it's uh, the house and the garage and workshop are already in situ. Um, access, parking plus improvements to Fell Lane have also been approved as part of that application, including improved resurfacing, um, a turning head and a passing bay within Fells Lane. This was granted in 2019. Uh, the applicant uh, then, uh, after obtaining permission, uh, wished to carry out some um, minor alterations to the design of the house and the garage. Um, this was then subsequently approved last year and uh, a very application, which is 24 slope 00574 very. Um, and in that application, that also includes the um, road improvement work. So that effectively entails a um, 100 metre section of the road to be uh, resurfaced and widened to three metres. This new intervisible um, passing bay, some drainage grips along the western side of the road and the access to the house um, being required to be a width of 5.5 metres for a distance of 7.5 metres um, from the carriageway. Um, as I say, um, works have commenced uh, with respect to this permission and the highways require these works to be completed prior to the occupation of the property. Now, what we are considering as part of this application relates purely in relation to those road improvement works. What the applicant has um, uh, tried to achieve is minimise the impact on the um, on Fells Lane by reducing uh, the extent of measures. So what they are proposing to do is remove the road widening and surfacing, um, remove the drainage grips and also reduce the width of the access to 3.5 metres instead of 5.5 to, uh, to, to um, gain access into the uh, application site. So just reiterating, this has already been approved previously. Um, the 
uh, the applicant in terms of this application has submitted a road safety audit at the request of the highway authority and and on the basis of this the highway authority are now supportive of the removal of these additional um, improvement measures however are quite clear that they would not support the removal of the passing bay um, Turning now to photographs, so um, I've got the icon, the blue blue arrow up there um, and denotes the uh, line of sight. So this is, you can see the house and um, the workshop and garage are all complete. This is Fells Lane along here. Um, now this is looking at this, you can follow the arrow, blue arrow along. Um, this is looking up along Fells Lane, um, getting towards the application site. Um, the application site itself and then looking in a southerly direction back against yourself down the lane. Now this is the area of contention, this is the proposed uh, passing bay location, um, looking at it along a, in a southerly direction and then this is where uh, further on um, uh, looking in a northerly direction now um, where the existing houses are to, to the left hand side. Um, there's a grouping of about four, five, four or so houses um, there. So there are a number of updates and I would draw your attention to the comments um, from the ward member in particular um, where he is stating that on balance he would like to see the very application approved as it conserves the appearance and character of Fells Lane far more than the original unvaried application. Obviously there's additional comments in there, I'll let you read those. Um, the recommendation is to um, grant subject to the um, conditions and notes and also there's an, uh, it, within the update sheet there is a slight update to the wording of condition four. Thank you chair. Thank you Louise. Um, we've got uh, three speakers on this one um, and we've got to uh, get the right name. Got Councillor Linda Goodrum, Napton Parish Council, objecting. So, you've got uh, three minutes, Councillor Goodrum. Uh, we'll give you a 30 second warning when you come to the end of your time.
30 seconds left. Perfect timing. Thank you very much. Uh, do anyone have any questions for Councillor Goodrum? Councillor Mills. Thank you very much. Um, yes, I'll, I was tempted to drive down there, but I didn't. Um, uh, well, I wasn't sure whether I'd get stuck. Um, but it is the one way, isn't it? Because when I, I, I was at the bottom, when I you know, went round the village and got yeah. to the bottom of Pell's Lane. I'm pretty sure it says... Um, no, Dobson's Lane. Pell's Lane and Dobson's Lane join the point. Yeah, but it's not the same as Dobson Lane. My mistake. I wish I'd driven it now. Thank you, Councillor Mills. Anybody have any other questions? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Councillor, I was just wondering, um, you suggested, I think, that the, uh, the the addition of a passing place would see increased traffic. I just wonder if the Parish Council has any evidence to support that. We don't have any evidence other than there are lots of Thank you. Anybody else have a question? Well, I've, I've got one if I may. Um, so without a passing place, if two vehicles meet, one coming up the lane, one coming down the lane, does somebody then have to reverse out onto another main road to, to allow that to allow them to pass? OK, thank you very much for that. Thank you. Uh, next speakers, uh, Mr. Roy Hammond, the agent, and uh, Michael Sanchez, the applicant. Uh, you've got three minutes in total, so decide yourselves how you want to cut that, how you want to carve that up. You go for a minute and a half each, or are you going to? Speak? No, I'll, I'll be probably 30, 40 seconds, something okay, like that. Okay, no problem then. Okay, okay. You can kick off then. Great. All right. Uh, good evening. Um, our eco build is now nearing completion, and we're proud uh, that most of our eco build um, principles have been achieved. Uh, we're trying to minimise the uh, impact on the environment and the community, and we've achieved an EPC uh, grade A score uh, for the property have a sizable underground rainwater tank and those sort of features uh, are what we are targeting. So we thank the officers for their support and would ask the committee to also support our request for this amendment so that we don't need to tarmac the middle section of the lane, which would make two thirds of it tarmac. Um, we believe 
um, that the condition that was insisted by WCC was erroneously put in place because of this misunderstanding about the refuse trucks needing them. Uh, the rural essence of the character of the lane, we believe, should be uh, preserved. And vehicle use on the uh, lane is minimal. Uh, I, in all the time we've been there, we've yet to have two vehicles going in the opposite direction. So, and tarmacking fundamentally is against the principles of what we're doing, trying to keep up an eco-friendly house. Uh, I'm happy to answer questions after. I'll hand over to Boy. OK, Mr Hammond then, yeah? My apologies. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm Roy Hammond and I speak on behalf of Mr Sanchez. The first thing I'd like to pick up on just, just to make it clear, there's been lots of talk about the passing place. The passing place has already been approved by your council. Uh, and I mean, and, and whether my client likes it or not, that passing, base, passing place needs to be provided. We welcome the officer's report and recommendation for approval. Uh, and I simply wanted to highlight that we felt very early on that the required works were disproportionate to the development that was proposed and would result in a considerable harmful change in what at the moment is a very quiet uh, rural lane. The changes proposed scale back those works considerably without undermining highway safety and I welcome the support now of the highway authority and at the same time the rural the, that character of that rural lane which is identified as being an important place in the neighbourhood plan would be retained. Uh, I would just like to also pick up upon the uh, complete comments from the Highway Authority. I know that they are requesting final details of the highway works to be agreed prior to commencement of the works. I, it's difficult to see what additional information we could provide. Uh, and I would question whether we do actually need to provide that further information. The, the Council has a uh, road, road safety audit. They have the they have the details of uh, the scaled back works. I don't believe condition that additional part to condition four is necessary. Mr and Mrs Sanchez are close to completing their house and we would be looking at potentially another three months of delay before they could, before they could get into their new home. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Right, uh, there's any councillors? Yeah, OK, Councillor Dixon, go for it. Uh, good evening. Um, just for my own clarification, um, first of all, is it a, have you achieved passive house status? And my second question is, are you wanting to put in that passing bay? I appreciate it is approved, but are you actually wanting to do it? Um, we're close to passive house. Uh, we're not going to spend all the money to get it certified, uh, but things like the, the air tightness testing and stuff like that, we achieved with only half done we achieved i think it was just uh, around two so we're we would be confident that if we did go to the expense of getting it passive house we would just about squeak in um and the other question was do you actually want to pass the day yourself no and, and and what i would if we had to have it then what i would hope the wcc would perhaps allow us to do it more in keeping so that as you've seen the lane is planings and stuff like that. So something that perhaps would grow over through lack of use <laughs> as a suggestion. Okay, uh, next question. Ah, Councillor Crum, come on. Hello again, hi. Uh, just, just confirm um, that obviously if this application was refused, you would refer back to your original application. It's got the turning head and the surfacing of the road. Correct. Yeah, that, that's correct. So if if you were to minded to refuse tonight's application, then the original wording of the condition and the extent of those improvements works would stand. And can I just have a follow up? And again, touch on yeah. Councillor yeah. Dixon's point, but this proposal, the variation, you've gone along with keeping the passing by in line with the County Council's recommendation. Yeah, that's correct. We yeah. we we didn't uh, as far. Uh, I know. We, yeah. OK. Yeah. All right. I'll just clarify. So everybody's clear. Basically, without leaving the passing bay, 
Warwickshire County Council Highways Department would not have approved us not tarmacking the surface. So perhaps, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll make no further comment, but yeah. Questions for these gentlemen? No, nope, I think you can, uh, you're, you're free to go then. Thank you very much for your, for your input. We'll move on to uh, points of clarification from the officer. Does anybody have one of those? Yeah, could I just? Yeah, Councillor Mill. Th thanks, Louise. Um, no, sorry, not Louise. Thank you, thank you Bill. Sorry, Louise. <laughs> It's, it's a long, it's a long day, isn't it? Um, Louise, um, how much of the lane is it taking out to put this pipe passing bay in? We can see here it's um, 4.8 metres. Let me see if I can. Yeah, I shall, but I'm going to do my special zoom thing. There we go. How about that? There we go. So it's saying it's a width of uh, 4.8 metres for a distance of 6 metres. All right. Yeah. Councillor Dixon. Thank you, Chairman. Louise, uh, can we approve this one and uh, not accept the Warwickshire County Council's recommendation or requirement to have a passing bay? <coughs> As, as we keep on referring, it's already been approved. So no, because um, in, in in terms of the, the applicant's requirements, the highway authority would change their recommendation to objection um, if they were to come forward with this. However, there is the valid fallback um, of the extant permission, which already has approved this in this position. Chair, I, I, I don't know whether this is a helpful thought, Chair. Um, I'm trying to be helpful here. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, first of all, it, it's not common for members to want to go against the recommendation of the Highway Authority. I appreciate that there may be occasions, but it's, it's unusual for you to choose to do that. In this instance, we don't actually know what the Highway Authority would say, because they haven't been consulted on the removal of the, the passing bay. They've been consulted on the other changes. Um, but I suppose with the cooperation of the applicant, if you were to defer tonight and the applicant was to amend his application to include a mission of the parking bay, we could then consult the Highway Authority. The Highway Authority could give their view and you could make your decision. The difficulty for the applicant is that if the Highway Authority were vehemently objecting to removing the, the passing bay, then there's the possibility that you would refuse his application that he doesn't want refusing. He wants it approved for the bits that he wants. Um, so I suppose the third option, and I, I'm, I'm thinking on my feet here, was the third option is to approve this as it stands and to invite the applicant to apply again to remove the passing bay. Um, we don't know what the outcome would be, but we would at least go through the process and we would have full knowledge before making the decision. D They're Dale, the best suggestions sorry, I, can I, I, I have to interject. Um, I, I believe there has been that discussion about the um, highway authorities' views if the passing bay were to be re removed. And I think that was a discussion that the applicants have already had and they've made it very clear that they will not support this going forward without the passing bay in situ. They would not support the removal of the, um, the, the minimising of the impacts of the removal of the other improvement works without this going forward. We, we, know, we, we know that. Yeah, absolutely. That, that, that is what we expect. That is what we think they will say. We no, they have the decision makers. Yeah, they have said. Yeah, but you are the decision makers. Yeah, sorry. I, I yeah. wouldn't recommend you to go down that line, but uh, if that's the line you want to go down, it's available to you. Councillor Crum. It's a statement or a question, Lily, so apologies if it isn't. I thought we had to discuss what's in front of us, not what's going to be. There's nothing in the actual application to remove the passing by. So therefore, what we've just talked about for the last five minutes, I think is irrelevant, unfortunately. 
Okay. So I don't know where you agree with that. That's the question. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I think I, I would entirely agree with you, Councillor Crum. You should decide the application in front of you. Yes, okay, and, the you and, and the outcome of, of the application in front of you, if you approve it, is that the passing bay will be built. If you refuse it, the passing bay will be built. And I think it's really important that you know that whichever decision you make, the passing bay is still required. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, no problem. OK. Right there. OK, so any other questions for, for the officer? No? OK, then we'll move straight to debate. Yeah, can, can I just hold you just for one second, just a minute? Uh, yeah, I'm saying this. I know this very well. It's in my county ward, and I've walked up and down a few times with my election leaflets over the years. Uh, still got the scars and limped to prove it. Um, this is certainly a difficult one. It's, it's a sensitive one for the residents of Napton and, and the councillors, and it's definitely caused a lot of debate. And I know there's been lots of discussions. On, I'm sure Louise and the case officer will attest to that. The variation, in my opinion, is better than the original application and certainly preserves the, the character of the line far more than the original application. Um, the turn in head removal, the service in less than the one third reduction, uh, to be one third now, it is certainly far more beneficial on that. I think the things can be done on, on the surface in as well um, that hopefully um, will, again will help try and protect it. So whilst it's never going to be 100% um, right, it's never going to please everybody. I've heard on the balance to support the application. Is that a proposal? Yeah, it's a proposal. Councillor Jennings. I'm happy to second that. OK, thank you very much. So, We've got a proposal, we've got a seconder uh, to uh, to agree with the officers and whatever. So, vote, in, vote for those in favour. Six, Chairman. Thank you very much. Those against? None. Abstaining? <laughs> One abstention, Chairman. Thank you very much. Right then, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we've got no urgent business. Uh, we can't start anything else now, so uh, I'm going to close the meeting. Thank you very much. Joe, Thanks. I owe you a pint. Well, did you promise me we'd get it done? No, <laughs> I kept the poor sod here all night. Haven't I? <laughs> I'm